Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, Immanuel Kant has a very interesting and important discussion of mathematics in the preamble uh, on the peculiarities of all metaphysical cognition, specifically in section two. And he's going to go into much greater depth and detail looking at the nature of mathematics in the first part, but we want to look at what he's actually telling us here. And the first thing that he, he says is mathematical uh, judgments, propositions, whatever we want to call them, are in fact synthetic. And we should remind ourselves what does this term synthetic mean for Kant, so it's opposed to the analytic. And with synthetic judgments as opposed to analytic, they are ampliative. That means they, they're adding something. They're, they're helping us towards having more, increasing the given cognition. We, we could talk about this in a number of different ways, and Kant uses several different synonymous descriptions of this. The basic idea is that synthetic judgments are in fact adding to our stock of knowledge, so we can not just clarify things as analytic judgments do, but we can come away with a fuller understanding of the matters that we're concerned with. And Kant will express this in terms of predicates and subjects. The subject, just as a little reminder, is the thing that is being talked about. The predicate is what you're saying about the subject or what you're thinking about it, what you're judging about the subject. So if I say it is, it is you know, a warm day today, we switch it around, today uh, is warm, right? Today is a designated time. Uh, that's the subject that we're talking about. And then the predicate is warm, right? What do we mean by that? Well, by comparison to other things. We can get into a lot of weeds thinking about that. But you see, subject and predicate. Or I am a 53-year-old man. A currently true statement uh, will be false shortly in the future right? and down the line. Um, I designates this thing here that's me and is a 53-year-old man predicate, right? So a lot of these things we have to learn experientially. Uh, Kant thinks that mathematical judgments are not empirical, but they are in fact synthetic. And he thinks that a lot of philosophers miss this, and this is a big problem. And he says that this fact seems hitherto to have altogether escaped the observation of those who have analyzed human reason. It seems even directly opposed to their conjectures. So not only did they miss it, they went the wrong direction, thinking that all mathematical uh, judgments are in fact analytic, when in, in the reality of things, they are mostly going to be synthetic. The, the ones that are truly or properly mathematical will be. And why did they do this? Well, he tells us it's because they got mixed up about um, some, some key matters having to do with the, what we call the law or the proposition of contradiction or non-contradiction. Um, so, you know, what is this that a thing cannot be and not, a thing cannot be and not be in the same way at the same time with a bunch of different provisos, right? So he goes on and he says that it was found that the conclusions of mathematicians proceed according to the principle of contradiction. You need that because he says you want to have apodictic certainty, the certainty that you can be absolutely sure about. 
Um, and so people persuaded themselves that the fundamental propositions, the Grundsatz, right, the things that we build mathematics out of, that they also followed from non-contradiction, which is not in fact the case. And he says that uh, a synthetic proposition can indeed be comprehended according to the principle of contradiction, but only, now this is really interesting, only by presupposing another synthetic proposition from which it follows. So you, you've got to have some synthetic propositions in the mix, in the background, in order to be able to use non-contradiction to derive things in mathematics or in, in what we also call geometry. So turning to properly mathematical propositions, he says, listen, there are always judgments a priori and not empirical because they carry with them necessity, which can't be obtained from experience. Uh, and then he says, you know, let, let's just confine ourselves to pure mathematics. Maybe somebody would argue about that. Is, is that synthetic or analytic? And he says, let's take an example. This is a very famous example. 7 plus 5 equals 12. Now, is 12 contained as the predicate in the subject 7 plus 5? You might say, yeah, that's just the way mathematics works, you know? Uh, that's what's so cool about it. That's what's so awesome about this discipline, where unlike just about everything else, you can be sure that 1 plus 1 equals 2, or 7 plus 5 equals 12. And Kant's not saying, well, you can't be sure about it, but you're not getting it by merely analyzing concepts. There's something new that is being added to the picture by saying seven plus five, subject, is 12, predicate over here. So he says, um, here we go, on closer examination, it appears that the concept of the sum seven plus five contains merely their union in a single number without it being at all thought what the particular number it is that unites them. The concept of 12 is by no means thought by merely thinking of the combination of seven and five and analyze this possible sum as we may. We may not discover 12 in the concept. We must go beyond these concepts. There's the ampliative uh, nature of synthetic judgments, right? We must go beyond this, uh, co these concepts by calling to our aid some intuition, some Anschauung, uh, applying or, you know, uh, corresponding to one of them, either our five fingers or five points, and we must succe add successfully the units of the five given in the intuition to the concept of seven. So our concept, he says, is really amplified or widened, uh, may, taken further by the proposition seven plus five equals 12. And we add to the first concept, a second one not thought in it. Uh, the predicate contains something that isn't in the subject. This is a perfect example, according to Kant, of a synthetic judgment. Now, he generalizes from this to say, all right, if it works for seven plus five equals 12, that means that arithmetical judgments are in fact all synthetic, especially if we use bigger numbers, right? Because we can say like, you know, one plus one, one plus one plus one equals three, and we can say, yeah, okay, I can kind of see how that all works together in this way, or one plus one equals two. But if we're adding, you know, some, some huge sets of numbers together, we actually have to do the, the math. We have to figure out what it is. Now, we're not doing something experiential or empirical by doing that, as Kant will tell us later. Uh, so the, this notion of intuition, um, you know, first of all, dissociate it from like a gut sense, which is one meaning of it. But we might also think about the intuitions that we have of, of things in space and time. And Kant is going to say, no, that's, that's not exactly what mathematics is drawing upon. I'm not actually looking at five fingers and another five and putting them together and counting them up and saying 10. Uh, we could do it with any objects we want to, right? So that, that's one of the things that's 
particularly important about it. What about geometry, where we're dealing with things that actually are presumably in space? There's a spatiality to them. He says, well, any principle of pure geometry is also synthetic. Here's an example. Straight line is the shortest path between two points. This is a synthetic proposition. Why? Because what's contained in the notion or the concept of straight line, just something qualitative, right? He says, my concept of, of straight contains nothing of quantity, but only a quality. The concept of the shortest quantitative concept is something additional and cannot be obtained by any analysis of the concept of straight line. Intuition, on showing, must come to aid us. It alone makes the synthesis possible. Isn't that interesting to say? So similar to how we can't just use the principle of non-contradiction, the principle that analytic judgments are based upon, right? Directly to derive synthetic judgments, but we have to have something synthetic. We also need some intuition coming in here. And now Kant will admit that there are a lot of things in mathematics that do seem like analytic principles. And he uses not just principles, but propositions, etc., and judgments, urteile, right, to describe these. And these, it is true that these exist in mathematics and in geometry. But he says that what are these doing? What is their function? It's not to actually increase our knowledge. It's just to serve as identical, identitia propositions, as what uh, we, we call a method of concatenation, putting things together, right? Zur Kette der Methode. Um, so a way of arranging things, a way of drawing further uh, conclusions, drawing out the implications of them. So he you know, gives some examples of these. A equals A, or the whole is equal to itself, or A plus B is greater than A, the whole is greater than its part. And he says, we can recognize these are valid, but they're only admitted in mathematics because they can be presented in some intuition. Again, we see the importance of Anschauung here. And he says, what makes us believe that the predicate of such apodictic judgments is already contained in our concept, and that the judgment is therefore analytic, is a duplicity of the expression. We get mixed up because of the way we talk about these matters. We must think a certain predicate is joined to a certain concept, and this necessity inheres in the concepts themselves. But the question is not what we must join in thought to the given concept, but what we must think together with it and in it, though obscurely. So it is manifest the predicate belongs to this concept necessarily indeed, but not directly, but indirectly by means of a necessarily present intuition. Now, again, Kant is going to explain much more about this in part one. Now, there is a disadvantage to philosophy that results from this, right? And what is this disadvantage? Not realizing that mathematics is, in fact, composed of synthetic judgments. And he talks about Hume here. David Hume, who awoke him from his dogmatic slumber, right? This is something where Hume missed the boat. Hume wants to say that mathematics is not experiential at all, which uh, Kant is cool with. Um, it is a priori, but it's a priori because it's essentially analytic. It's a matter of relations of ideas. Logic would fit in there as well. Logic and mathematics, as we learn later on, can actually be, in large part, uh, converted into each other, right? But going on, um, what is this, this problem here? He says, um, Hume imagined that, that the nature of mathematics depended on totally different principles, on the principle of contradiction alone, and though he didn't divide judgments in the manner formally and universally and did not use the same terminology, what he said was equivalent to this. Pure mathematics contains only analytic, but metaphysics synthetic a priori judgments. And he says, yeah, he was wrong about that. And what is the consequence of being wrong? Hume says, or Kant says, 
Hume could have extended his question concerning the origin of our synthetic judgments far beyond the metaphysical concept of a causality and included in it the possibility of mathematics a priori also. If you do that, you can actually make a certain kind of progress that Kant says that he has made that Hume failed to make and everybody else prior to them has failed to make as well. So this is not just like a little digression or just being, you know, making sure that you've, as we say, crossed every T and dotted every I being, being very complete and comprehensive. This has got some pretty important implications uh, saying that mathematics is composed of synthetic a priori judgments when metaphysics, according to Kant, is too. We can learn something about these two different fields by exploring mathematics, as he is going to do in the first part of the prolegomena.